All right. And can you see the slides right now? Yes, I can. All right. Excellent. So welcome to this workshop an introduction to data literacy. Um, and just to kind of introduce myself, uh, my name is Russell Peterson. I am a research and instructional services librarian. I work mostly with the Modern Languages Department um, and the Capstone Center for Student Success. Um, but I also have like research interests in disinformation, conspiratorial thinking, and kind of cultivating um, critical thinking skills, especially when it comes to how data is presented, um, both in um, scholarly sources, but also just like in information we interact with every day, like on social media or within other uh, more traditional media spaces. And that is also my contact information if anyone wants to get a hold of me after this presentation. Um, some goals for today's session, I want um, every participant who is either um, participating now or watching later to understand what data is and how it's used for rhetorical, commercial, and political purposes, um, identifying the errors and discrepancies and how data is represented, as well as being able to engage with data visualizations in multiple contexts um, with a healthy degree of skepticism, not um, seeing every single visualization as something to um, be inherently skeptical about, but to exercise a, a healthy degree, to know when it's the appropriate time to say, let's actually question this and question like how this data was gathered, how um, it's being represented and what kind of like narrative or argument is being constructed here. And then lastly, um, being able to communicate um, interp interpretations of data with your peers or with anyone else that you interact with on a daily basis when you come across um, either data visualization or um, some other type of representation of data. And so let's first talk about what is data and how it's used um, for everyday purposes. Um, by defining it, first I can say the data is information, um, either in a quantitative or qualitative fashion, and it's often um, collected for a specific purpose. So um, this could be data that is collected from a survey and um, it's trying to gauge, for instance, how many people are using a particular commercial product, um, say like a makeup brand or um, let's see, like a certain technology like the iPhone or any other type of um, technology like that. So it could be for a specific commercial purpose. It could be data that's gathered to kind of glean how people feel about a particular issue. So the Pew Research Center, for instance, is gathering um, data that is like both qualitative, like people's um, phone interviews and focus groups, but it's also kind of gathering um, how people might respond in a particular situation if they're answering a survey question. Um, and so that data could be raw or it could be um, cleaned as well. It could be organized in a certain fashion and displayed in a tabular way, um, like through charts and Excel spreadsheet, or um, it could be represented as like a data visualization that you can see on the right-hand side here. Um, it's like a heat map of, um, of Eastern Europe. Um, and so data is given meaning by the context that it's situated in, how it is um, presented or how it is gleaned or gathered. So whoever is gathering that data, um, is it being represented through a chart or is it being represented through a map or um, what have you? That really is what is giving the data um, meaning, not just um, what kind of questions it's asking, but how it's kind of situated as well. Like who is um, responsible for um, presenting this data? And data is rendered visually to aid in pattern finding comprehension. It's definitely used to persuade people um, as to um, kind of like to have people agree on a certain argument or to um, give like a clarity of, of purpose. And then using data. So in the scientific community, data is used to prove a hypothesis, um, but in other realms, uh, business, like I was saying earlier with um, technology, um, data is used to justify decision making um, by conveying a numerical authority that's difficult to challenge. So if like Apple, for instance, is releasing 
um, a set of like reports saying that like, oh, like sales of all of our products have been going up by like 20% in this past quarter. Um, it's hard to kind of like challenge that on its face because um, numbers by themselves convey an authority that can be hard to dispute unless um, you know something more, um, unless you're more, I would say skeptical about how that data is being represented. Like if they're saying, oh, like our sales for the iPad have been going up 20% this past quarter, um, but then you see like over a set of time that overall sales are declining, then that makes you question um, how they're actually presenting that data and how they're conveying that. Um, and so the three main ways that um, data is used to convey um, authority is rhetorically, um, it's used to win an argument of some sort. Um, this is definitely true in the political sphere um, or, or, in, or in other spheres, uh, commercial to sell a particular product. Um, but in the political sphere, it's also used to gain power. Um, so if people are like having, are releasing like certain polls to indicate that like, oh, 75% of Americans um, are in agreement on this particular issue, or they do not like this particular policy, um, that is used to kind of justify um, putting in that policy in the first place. And so what is uh, data literacy? Like, how do we like make sense of um, this particular skill that is used to um, kind of like have a more fluency with data, being able to interpret it? Um, and I've cited two librarians here who have helped define what data literacy is in our particular field. Um, and Chantal Risdale says that data literacy is the ability to collect, manage, evaluate, and apply data in a critical manner. Um, while Javier Calzado Prado and Miguel Angel Marsal um, define data literacy as the component of information literacy that enables individuals to access, interpret, critically assess, manage, handle, and ethically use data. Um, for today's workshop, we won't be really talking about um, ways of like collecting or um, using data, but we'll definitely be talking about um, how to evaluate data um, how to critically assess it, um, as well as like, how can we access it through um, some of the databases here at the library. And so data in context, how was data gathered? So how can we establish context and give data meaning uh, for what it is? Um, and ways that we can determine context is by asking some sense-making questions, uh, for example, um, who, what is the entity or organization responsible for gathering the data? That could be important if it is like, say a well-respected um, uh, research body like the Pew Research Center, or um, is it like a more partisan source or is it a more um, commercially focused source? Um, that could lead you to question um, like, how was this data gathered? Should we trust um, the, the entity behind it? Um, what, what kind of data is being collected? What is being measured? Um, so is this quantitative data? Is this just um, by the numbers? Um, this is like how many people like, responded to a particular question maybe, or um, is it like, was this data gathered through like telephone interviews? And what are the implications of say, um, data that's gathered through a landline that not many people own anymore versus um, data that's gathered through um, cell phone interviews, for example. Um, where, where is the data being gathered? Is it in a particular setting or location? Um, is it relevant if it's just um, data gathered in the United States? If it's data gathered from two very different places, how does that play into um, whether the data is trustworthy or not? Um, when, when is like the exact timeline for collecting this data? If the data was collected maybe 20 years ago, um, does that mean that it's still relevant for today? Um, why, for what purpose was this data gathered? Um, are these intentions stated or being inferred? Um, so any data that is being gathered um, for any particular purpose, um, whether that is like required by law maybe, if like crime data, for instance, has to be gathered by law. How are they gathering that? Um, so you have to kind of consider like the purpose behind that data gathering as well. 
Um, and then, yeah, what was the method for collecting the data and what medium did it take place? Um, I think internet polls can have a lot of um, inherent problems. Um, so it, it's important to kind of see in, in what manner was, was data gathered so that you can properly evaluate, okay, is this like a source that, um, that properly kind of like assessed all of like the unique um, different um, challenges that a particular medium presents when you are gathering data in a particular way. And now I'm going to have you um, kind of like look for data on your own. Um, and we're gonna do this by going to the Statista database. And we're gonna look up um, two particular studies. Um, and by doing this, we're just gonna extract keywords from like these research questions and apply those keywords in a search in Statista. So um, what are the number of COVID-19 vaccine doses administered in the US by manufacturer? Um, we can do that by um, just extracting keywords like COVID-19 vaccine um, and manufacturer and applying those keywords into Statista. And the same for how many high school students are using nicotine vaping cartridges. Um, high school students could be a keyword mixed in with nicotine vaping as well. Um, so yeah, I'm going to exit out of this presentation here so that we can um, go to the library's website and I can show you actually how to get to Statista. And I see we have um, a new person enter. Hello. Um, we are just now going to um, starting this activity of looking up um, certain data sets and we're going to ask some sense making questions of um, who is the entity that is responsible for gathering the data? What is the data? Um, when was it gathered? Uh, where was it gathered? Why, for what purpose? And um, what medium was it gathered? So I'm gonna show everyone um, just how to actually get to Statista. So I'm at the library's website, which is lib.ua.edu. I'm at the homepage here. I'm gonna click the databases icon. And then I am going to filter down to the S databases and then scroll down to Statista. All right, here we go. Now we're at Statista. All right, was everyone able to um, get to where I am right now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. See a thumbs up. Excellent. All right. So I'm just going to go back to um, the slide right here. And I'll just like allow a few minutes for everyone to um, kind of like look up these studies and then um, share your conclusions with us.
Okay. So I think Owen oh, the chat put down um, some information about, so I think you did find the study that kind of like outlined um, what are the number of vaccine doses administered? Um, Pfizer is definitely the clear majority, followed by Moderna and then J&J &J with 15 million. Um, yeah, so let me go to Statista and show you that study. Let's see vaccine doses, manufacturer. All right, as of October 2018 by manufacturer. Okay. All right, so this is the, st this is the exact study. Um, as of October 17, 2021, these are the number of vaccine doses administered by the manufacturer. Um, and in terms of like sense making questions, um, what were you able to like, determine about um, this study and how the data was gathered? chat so it was gathered by the cdc right so yeah we can see like from the source um it was gathered by um centers for disease control um if you click on their source link they even give you like more in depth um kind of like telling you how they were able to um collect this information so um they were able to get this data from all of their vaccine partners um so that includes clinics retail pharmacies long-term care facilities um and let's see. Yep, and they're even like some giving some disclaimers. Um, it counts people as fully vaccinated. They received two doses on two different days, or received one dose of a single dose vaccine. Yep, and so this data um, is also including boosters. And you can kind of surmise, so it's like, since it's the CDC, like they're kind of um, collecting this information for um, governmental purposes. That is like their charge, that is their mission to um, kind of like track the health outcomes for um, every American, especially um, during the pandemic. It is their job to keep track of this information. Um, so you can kind of like kind of assess like based on that, that, um, like this is kind of like a worthy source to use when citing about um, how many vaccines are being administered in the United States. Okay. And then for the, let's see, the nicotine vaping um, high schoolers. Uh, before I do the search, um, yeah, I guess like what were people finding about um, this study in, in terms of like how was the data gathered and where it was gathered. Yeah, feel free to put that in the chat or to speak up. Okay. All right, so this one also looks like it was from the CDC. Yeah. Okay. So we'll do another Statista search, nicotine. So nicotine vaping cartridges. Okay. So let's say prevalence of nicotine cartridge vaping among students in the US by grade. Okay. Yeah, so you might've found another CDC study um, but the one I'm looking up here seems to be from the Pew Research Center. Uh, but there was uh, one more, although it's uh, the latest study of 2020. Yeah. Okay, so you, you found a 2020 study? Excellent. Yeah, it's a collective of all, I'll put it in the link. Okay, so we can also, yeah, look up that study, nicotine vaping 2020. 
Okay, I'll put the link in the chat. Okay, great. Nicotine use share of U.S. high school students. Okay, great. Yep, so this is percentage of U.S. high school students using e-cigarettes, and we can kind of like see um, a sharp jump from 2017 to 2018, and then a slight dip um, in 2020. And we can go to like the source link specifically and see this is the morbidity, morbidity, sorry, morbidity and mortality weekly report um, that was released at the end of 2020 kind of like giving a more like in-depth description about the use of e-cigarettes. Um, and again, that is like the charge of the CDC um, to kind of like highlight like what are like the health impacts for a particular um, product like e-cigarettes, especially among um, younger people. All right, excellent. Um, so going back to um, our presentation here, I think it's worthwhile to kind of develop these skills of trying to figure out like where um, data is coming from, um, just so that you can properly assess like, okay, like how, what is the meaning of this data? Where is it coming from? Because it can be often not represented in those like very handy charts that you see in Statista. It might be like a screenshot of a graph um, that you see online on Twitter, or um, it could be represented in multiple different ways. Um, and so even if um, data is coming from um, a certain place, um, you also have to pay attention to um, how is this data being delivered and is it being used to um, mislead in a certain way. And that goes into the next section of our presentation is being able to um, spot whether intentionally or unintentionally there is data that's being represented in a certain way that it is misleading. And um, to quote kind of like a, a seminal piece in, um, in this topic, I'm gonna quote Daryl Huff who um, wrote How to Live Statistics back in 1954. Um, so st statistical methods and statistical terms are necessary in reporting the mass data of social and economic trends, business conditions, opinion polls, the census, but without writers who use the words with honesty, understanding, and readers who know what they mean, the result can only be semantic nonsense. So um, the numbers by themselves can't really tell you a story. They can't really tell you um, a certain argument or persuade you in a certain way. It's only writers who um, are able to um, ethically um, use that data and convey maybe a certain narrative. Um, or um, it also takes readers who maybe are able to like kind of understand and able to interpret that data in order to make sense of it and maybe be um, exercise their judgment in terms of saying like this, um, is an appropriate use of data or this is an inappropriate use or um, some, someone is like not being forthright with how they're kind of conveying information. And so I'm gonna kind of go through a couple of different examples of um, how data can be misused in this way, um, how it can be used to mislead. Um, and so the first example would be um, something called sampling bias. Um, and so this is a statistical um, practice where um, someone is trying to, um, excuse me, it's a way of selecting like a small group of individuals in order to estimate certain characteristics about a population. So um, there are claims that are being made um, when a sample is more, so stronger claims are made when a sample is more representative of a whole rather than taking like a small um, section of those individuals. Um, and so that sampling bias occurs when members of an intended population are overrepresented or underrepresented. Um, and so it also occurs when um, the people who are gathering the data are compromised in some way. Um, so for example, um, like, I think a common example of sampling bias is, is like a slogan that you see in a lot of um, like 
dental products, like nine out of 10 dentists recommend using Colgate, um, using this certain toothpaste. Um, and there are like certain assumptions that are being made there in that like, oh, that must mean that like hundreds of or tens of thousands of dentists have been surveyed on this. Um, and then like all, like all these dent dentists definitely like responded to that survey and they definitely don't have um, an incentive to um, lie to everyone if they were um, doing this of their own volition. Um, but so there's several assumptions that are being made when um, you come across a statement like this. So who was being surveyed? What was the sampling size? So it could be the case that only um, like 50 dentists were surveyed. And, and so that's definitely not as representative of like the entire um, dentistry profession. Um, and who are those particular respondents? Are they actually dentists? Did, were they forced to kind of like show their credentials or um, were, was it just like people that were kind of like found in the street and saying like, oh, um, like you are a dentist professional. <laughs> um, and are there like incentives to lie? Were people that were surveyed, um, did they, were they, for example, um, um, paid to give their opinion or, um, is this like a particular, um, are, 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 do they, how should I frame this? Um, it does it benefit their career in any way to like respond to a survey, maybe if it's from a very prestigious outlet. Um, so that could be some examples of, of why you might want to think about, are there any incentives for people to not be forthright? Um, and I think this also plays into when people are asked about very sensitive topics, like topics about money or about um, drug use or sex. Um, these are topics that people tend to either exaggerate or kind of conceal um, their behavior or activities. Um, so some examples of sampling bias might be um, like, an like an alumni report that says like the average um, University of Alabama graduate makes over $100,000 per year. Um, so it's worth asking like how many like alums were surveyed? Was this only like business students? Was this only like engineering students? How many like total um, Alabama graduates were surveyed. Um, and then um, another example being like a new poll states that 85% of Americans have never consumed an illegal substance. Um, people are incentivized to lie about those topics because um, they might not want to admit to doing anything illegal in a survey. They might not trust the survey taker. Um, so it's worth kind of considering like how might the sample that was gathered from a particular survey might be biased in a particular direction. Um, another um, method that it could be used, another statistical method that people use to maybe mislead others is cherry picking. Um, and so cherry picking is um, the practice of only using um, a um, small subset of data to kind of sell a certain narrative um, so I think I brought up Apple as a uh, example earlier of maybe a company that, um, is only, um, they might only want to share a particular, um, subset of data, kind of like make themselves look good and maybe drive up, drive up, uh, market share of, um, of their stock and saying like, um, like this, in this particular quarter, like this. Um, technology product like sold like this many units, but it doesn't look at like the years long trends of like that particular product not selling well and actually declining in sales. Um, and so debates over issues like climate change and crime rates are a big victim of cherry picking because um, rapid changes from year to year do not account for years or decade long trends. Um, so a lot of um, people who engage in like climate change denialism um, kind of like show like maybe a small subset of climate data saying like, oh, um, it's actually showing that the earth is cooling over time. Or there's just like so much like rapid changes that you can't really say that the earth is like warming. Um, but then it's not taking into account like decades long data that's showing that um, 
the amount of the, the temperature of the earth is actually rising at an unsteady rate and it's going above like certain industrial levels. Um, and the same is true for uh, crime data as well. Um, this is a screenshot from the San Francisco, San Francisco Chronicle. They had a tweet um, a few months ago saying that car break-ins are up 753%. Um, and that like begs the question of like, what, what actually happened in, in 2020? Um, there was like a massive like pandemic that um, caused a lot of people to stay inside. Um, and so that isn't accounting for maybe like a, like maybe five years of data or 10 years of data that could show that like crime um, could be actually decreasing. There's a lot of data to suggest that crime is still steadily declining across um, the years and especially over the decades since the 1970s. Um, another statistical, um, I guess, method that people use to mislead is to um, conflate correlation and causation. Um, just because I'm sure you both have heard this before, just because something is correlated um, or two things are correlated doesn't mean that one is the cause of the other. Um, so for even if like a claim turns out to be true, like in this example, um, so just to kind of describe this graph here, it's showing that um, countries that didn't implement a mask mandate right away um, had a huge explosion in cases while ma um, countries that did mask up had fewer cases. Um, this is an example of um, something that two things that are correlated. Um, there could be a whole bunch of different factors that might explain um, this correlated phenomenon. Um, a lot of those countries, for example, um, in South Korea, Japan, Singapore, these are all like East Asian countries. Um, maybe it doesn't document um, maybe particular practices in those countries that don't have to deal with masking. Um, it could be the case that the virus was not as prevalent in those communities, where, whereas it was more prevalent in these European and North American countries. Um, there are so many other different factors that could explain that, even if um, it turns out that masks are very helpful in curbing the spread of coronavirus. Um, it's important to kind of like be um, kind of aware of that and be kind of skeptical about arguments that say that um, this like one singular issue is the cause of this very complex problem. Um, so it is worth kind of like questioning something, even if um, it turns out that that kind of thing might be um, might be true in certain cases that masks are very helpful in curbing the spread, but it doesn't account for um, kind of the multifaceted complexity of why coronavirus cases are rising in some places and not others. Um, and then there are ways that uh, visualizations are used to um, mislead people. Um, and there are certain practices that are used within visualizations to mislead people. Um, so one example of this is truncating graphs and omitting the baseline on the y-axis. So um, in both of these examples, um, the baseline is at this very um, incredibly high number. So like in this example, um, 94 million is like the, the cutoff point when it really should be zero. Um, and so the effect of that is that it can mi misrepresent data um, as more exaggerated or more dramatic than it actually is. And um, yeah, so this chart on the right, it says that over 100 million people now receiving federal welfare. Um, and it's kind of like looking at this kind of like explosion of cases over time from 2009 to 2011. Um, but if we had the baseline at zero, you could see that that's like a very um, marginal change compared to the actual numbers. Um, and I think that chart counts anyone um, receiving federal welfare as anyone residing in a household in, in which at least one person received um, a program benefit. So that could be Medicare, Medicaid, um, or, um, sorry, so anything figures count means tested welfare, not social security or Medicare. Okay, so it could be like anyone in 
um, a particular household that's affected. So that could be Medicaid or um, a different um, federal assistance program like um, temporary assistance for needy families, for example. Um, so anyone who is receiving that benefit, um, they count everyone in the household as receiving that benefit. So that's just something to keep in mind for that particular chart. Um, and the one on the left, um, it's, <laughs> there are many problems with this chart, but one is um, it's kind of exaggerating the, um, the shortness of women from South Africa and India um, because the baseline is set at um, very close to um, by feet. And so this isn't like equal intervals. Um, so it kind of like makes it seem like people from, or women from Latvia and Australia are um, gigantic compared to um, women from South Africa and India when it just is just a couple inches um, and not like a huge like marginal or significant difference. Um, another example is just more manipulations of the y-axis. Um, so intervals between the x and y-axis should be um, even and consistent. And visualizations that manipulate those intervals um, do so by exaggerating um, an increase or de decrease through the use of like labels or um, illustrated elements or color. Um, and so like this example on the left, if y'all can see it, is um, cancer screenings um, and preventative services are going down for Planned Parenthood, but abortions um, are going up from 2008 to 2013. Um, but the issue is that these two numbers should be like completely different. Um, this is like going from like 2 million to 900,000. But for exa some example, for some reason, the 300,000 um, abortions are, are like above um, this number right here. So the numbers don't even seem to be on the same plane there. It's like a manipulation of the y-axis. Um, whereas for um, this example on the right, um, under President Obama, more students are earning their high school diplomas um, than ever before. Um, even though it is like a marginal increase from 75% in 2009 um, to 82% in 2015, um, it's kind of like shown that this is like over like half of like this particular number based on the amount of books that are being stacked. Um, and so like since the baseline, um, since the y-axis is like being manipulated here, um, you can't like really see um, how profound the difference actually is um, for the number of students with high school diplomas. Um, I would say one of um, the most notorious examples of going against um, or kind of like manipulating people or um, misleading people with data visualizations is going against conventions, going against standard conventions and data visualizations like um, the y axis should start at the bottom left and should start at zero. Um, that's like a pretty common convention when it comes to line graphs and bar graphs. Um, and the reason for that is that um, charts and graphs are, um, have become more standardized and um, to go against that standardization, to go against those conventions um, can be very confusing for people at first glance. Um, and so it's kind of generally agreed upon that you should like start the y-axis at zero at the bottom left so you're not confusing people. Um, and this kind of like notorious visualization starts the um, y-axis at like a thousand um, to, to kind of like convey an argument that um, after 2005, after the standard year ground law, the number of murders committed using firearms actually decreased. Um, but the problem is, is that if you actually flip this um, to where it should be, if zero was actually down here, um, you could see that the number of murders committed using firearms actually increased after that um, law was implemented in Florida. Um, and so that's like one example of just like how going against conventions can mislead people um, because it's not properly um, starting 
the y-axis at its proper point. Um, one ex this example right here is um, actually going with conventions um, with population density maps. Um, usually darker colors are meant to represent that something is more densely populated. So the states of California, Illinois, and New York, Massachusetts, New Jersey are more densely populated than Wyoming and Montana. Um, but if that convention was reversed in some way, um, if people, if for example, you tried to say that um, the lightly shaded colors indicate more densely, a more densely densely populated place, um, that would confuse readers who are already used to um, knowing that a place that is lightly shaded should be um, less densely populated. So they might confuse certain places to be um, more populated than, than they should be, um, and so that that can be pretty. Um, important when you see like a, a visualization like on social media like on twitter or instagram um, and you're just kind of like briefly glancing on it you're not really studying it in depth if it goes against a certain convention um, that could easily like mislead someone to thinking um, a certain idea is true or not and then um, using the wrong chart <laughs> can be a pretty big um, way of misleading people or at least confusing them um, Pie charts, for example, are notoriously misused. Um, they're supposed to represent parts of a whole. Um, so this example on the left doesn't really make sense of um, Americans who have tried marijuana, 51% say today, 43% say last year, 34% say 1997. Um, yeah, that just doesn't make any sense because um, if you're trying to gauge like how um, maybe marijuana use has changed over time, you would use a very different um, kind of visualization to display that um, versus like a pie chart, which should always like add up to 100% and it should um, be kind of like parts of a whole. It should be like the um, show, like how the variable represents or um, how it's related to the variable and how it's representing parts of a whole um, versus, um, certain other types of visualizations. Um, there are data um, that correspond with certain types of visualizations. So if it's data that is being used um, to compare to um, values, to um, with the differences or similarities in those values, you would use um, comparisons. So like bar charts, um, dumbbell plots are pretty good for those. Um, if you're trying to kind of gauge relationships, a heat map, um, for example, you're trying to show um, whether there's connections in data or depicting like a correlation or lack thereof. Um, heat maps or scatter plots are good for that. Um, distribution, um, visualiz visualizations that display frequency or maybe changes over time. A histogram would be a lot better for um, this kind of data right here, this kind of poll showing a change over time compared to a pie chart. All right, so now we are going to um, rank visualizations. Um, and so since we have um, two of you here, I'm going to um, put two PDFs in the chat. Um, feel free to maybe choose one PDF over the other, but essentially you'll be ranking visualizations from um, which visualization is most reliable versus which ones are the least reliable. Um, and just using what you've kind of like learned today about um, how visualizations are um, represented, um, how people maybe are um, misusing certain visualizations to convey an argument. Um, you can see um, just like what visualizations might be more reliable versus what might be least reliable. Uh, so I'm going to um, stop. Um, no, what I'm going to do is actually put this in the chat that so everyone can see it. Um, let's see if I can actually share a PDF here. Um, hmm. One second here. I think what I'm going to do is um, 
I don't think I'm actually able to share files in the chat. My apologies. So what I'm going to do is going to do a screen share of um, one of one of those files that contains all those visualizations so that you all can see um, that file and be able to kind of comment which one is most reliable versus which one is least reliable. So let me um, go ahead and find that and then um, I will share that with everyone. Now I'm going to use the second one. All right, so I'm going to share my screen one more time. Okay. And you all can see this PDF right now. Give me a thumbs up if you can. Awesome. Yeah. Great. So um, let's see these four visualizations right here. I'm going to zoom out a bit. Um, okay. So let's see. If... Okay. So we have two visualizations right here. One is a population density map. Um, one is kind of a donut or um, another kind of like pie chart um, that is showing um, how many seats that the Labour Party in the UK won versus how many seats that the Tories won um, based on your first impressions of these visualizations. How would you ca characterize their reliability? You know, one seems more reliable than two, definitely. Um, it's definitely following the conventions of the um, of population density maps of um, red is used to indicate that a place is more, has more population density versus um, um, colors like yellow and green. Uh, and then yes, the one from the sun, um, I think, <laughs> One thing to kind of like note is that um, the UKIP party is kind of like, even though it didn't win any seats, it's shown to like have at least half of what the Liberal Democrats won um, with that with this chart. Um, and the SNP almost has like the exact same area as the Liberal Democrats, even though they won more. Um, so it is definitely um, misleading, like how this is represented here. Um, is even though um, this party didn't even win anything, it's so, somehow like represented on this donut chart. Yeah, UKIP shouldn't even be showing since that's zero exactly. All right, and then like these two other visualizations right here. Um, one is showcasing types of debt by the average US household. And then um, this second chart at the bottom here. Um, it's showing hours spent online by age and gender. And it's using a bubble chart. And one seems more reliable than two here. Yeah, I would say, um, yeah, the second one, this is like a weird way to kind of like distinguish um, differences between like men and women um, by like showing, um, yeah, it's hard to kind of like even discern um, what these different <laughs> bubbles mean if it's like comparing something to something else. Um, yeah, so maybe 12 year old men are spending more hour or spending less hours online than 12 year old women. It could be hard to kind of gauge that at first. Yeah, I think the different size of the circles is that supposed to convey that um, that those uh, this is, is this supposed to indicate that more people are spending time online there yeah it's it's kind of 
difficult to kind of gauge like how um, that is even relevant at all. Um, yeah, the bubble chart. Yeah, yeah, it, it is quite unclear. Um, yeah, bubble charts are often used to kind of demonstrate frequency. Um, I think like heat maps, for example, show like um, if a place is like more densely populated or more people um, are responding to a particular issue, like the bubble like expands, it gets bigger. Um, but in this context, it doesn't really make sense. Um, you would think that like a, maybe a bar chart would be more appropriate there. Um, whereas this one, um, yeah, I would say it's, this is probably the best way to capture that data is um, with kind of like the stacked bar there. Um, it is like a little bit misleading though, in that, um, yeah, auto loans are taken to be like three fourths of mortgages, even though 28,000 is definitely a lot less than 176,000. Um, and so I think that this chart here needs to be adjusted in terms of um, like how, how much um, credit cards and auto loans kind of need to be like kind of cut in half, shrunken significantly compared to mortgage debt and, and um, student loans, especially. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go back to um, the slides here. And um, just kind of ask some final thoughts about um, how do you think um, you will engage with data in the future now that you've kind of like seen these examples of how data could be used to mislead, um, knowing the importance of um, the context of data, how it's gathered, um, how it's being represented and presented to um, give a particular argument, whether that is for commercial, rhetorical, or political purposes. Um, yeah, just I think being able to be literate with data means being able to critically assess it and being able to um, know, for example, um, why data is being presented in a particular way and for what purpose. Um, so I'm hoping um, after this presentation, you'll have the takeaway of um, you can properly um, see data, whether that's like it's represented through social media or um, other channels um, like in scholarly sources, for example, and be able to kind of maybe look at the meth methodology section and see like, how did they re really gather this data? Can we um, properly trust um, the argument that's being conveyed to me? Um, so yeah, I hope um, that folks kind of like have that takeaway after viewing this presentation today, um, but I'd be happy to answer um, any questions that you have um, let me just share um, my works cited page right here and just kind of sharing how um, I put this together today, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Good. In the chat here, I'm going to pay, um, be careful, pay attention to what information is intended to be conveyed. Also pay attention to things like cherry picking manipulation of axes. Yeah, absolutely. Will the slides be made available? Yes, um, the slides, including my notes on those slides, um, I will email to each of the registered participants. Um, and this recording of this presentation will also be made available as well. All right, wonderful. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, and if you're watching this recording later, feel free to email me. Um, I'll put up my contact information um, so that everyone can see that. Do, do, do. You can reach me via email at rtpeterson1 at ua.edu um, or contact me via phone as well. I'm happy to answer your questions in whatever way you want to get a hold of me. So um, thanks, everyone. Um, I really appreciate uh, you reaching out and um, 
and listening to my presentation today. Thank you.